Good morning, everybody. This is a new colloquium by the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia under the Severo Ochoa program. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Christian Boye from the University of Córdoba in Argentina. And he will talk about chaos and instabilities in planetary system. Uh, Christian will be properly introduced by Dr. Isabel Marquez. Please, Isabel. Hello, hello everybody. Thank you very much for coming here to uh, another session of our uh, Severo Ochoa um, Colloquia. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to have today uh, uh, Professor Christian Bourget. Uh, um, Christian Bourget is professor and researcher at the Astronomical Observatory of the National University of Córdoba in, in Argentina, uh, the, um, the UNC. He graduated from the UNC and did his PhD at the University of uh, Sao Paulo in, in Brazil. As a professor, he teaches us in both uh, grade and post-grade courses at the, uh, at the University, uh, National University of Córdoba, the Córdoba in Argentina, not the, the one close to us here in Spain. And since <laughs> 2007, he has tutorized or co-tutorized seven uh, postdoc professors and supervised several pre-doc and postdoc uh, researchers. Since 2018, he's the director of the doctoral studies at the University uh, in Córdoba, National University in Córdoba. Uh, as a researcher, he's mostly interested in celestial mechanics and the dynamics of planetary systems. He's author of more than 60 papers published in uh, peripheric journals and has authored or co-authored more than 30 books. Additionally, he has uh, participated in a lot of outreach and communication activities, uh, including talks, conference, TV shows, uh, etc. Uh, since 2005, uh, uh, there is an asteroid uh, called with, with, with his family name, uh, Bourget. So that's an honor that uh, only a, a few people research. research. Uh, additionally, uh, today uh, he will talk to us uh, about uh, Chaos and instabilities in uh, planetary systems, as the um, as the image in the first image in, in his view with uh, is showing. So uh, welcome, uh, Professor Bourget. Um, I um, take the opportunity to extend the invitation to an in-person one when possible. In I hope in the near future, and uh, so the, the the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the for the invitation for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to be to be here with you. And uh, okay, so uh, today I, I will talk to you about basically the aim of the talk will be to present and let you know uh, a new numerical technique that we have been working on for the past couple of years to estimate what is the instability time of multi-planetary systems. And this is a collaboration uh, with uh, Claudio Giordano and Pablo Cincota of La Plata University. Silvio Ferraz Melo and Rafael Alves Silva of the University of São Paulo in, in, in Brazil and myself. So uh, the question of stability of planetary systems. So imagine that you discover or you, you, you are studying a planetary system with n planets orbiting a star of mass m0. So you have m values of the masses and values for the orbital elements. And so the first thing that you wonder is if this system is dynamically stable. But there's an even more important or relevant question is how long will this system survive before disruption? And this is what we mean by the instability time. So this is a very, very old question, but highly relevant, particularly now with the discovery of so many exoplanetary systems, many of whom are completely different from our own. Uh, uh, solar system. And there has been significant progress in the past couple of years, both in the uh, development of complex analytical models, as well as numerical tools to try to address this question. So the ultimate goals of all of these methods, including our own contribu contribution, is on one hand to try to establish reliable and relatively fast stability criteria which may then be applied both to observed and fictitious systems. But equally important is to try to understand why a given system may be stable or unstable. In other words, what drives these instabilities that you, you may sometimes encounter. 
So as this instability is mainly driven by chaotic diffusion in this phase space, there are some concrete questions that we would like to ask and try to address during this talk. Mainly, how is this chaos related to dynamical features of the system? Does all chaotic behavior lead inexorably to instability? Is it possible to re relate chaotic indicators with the instability time? How we may use this diffusion to estimate this instability time? And last of all, whether these values that we're trying to establish can be calculated in a very precise manner. Okay, so these are the questions that I would like you to be thinking about throughout this talk. There is one uh, numerical tool that is very interesting to, to, to show results and which I will use and use extensively throughout this talk, which is what is called dynamical maps. So just to review what is a dynamical map. So if you have, again, your n planet system, so you have six n orbital elements plus the n man masses. So you may fix values for all these system par parameters except two of them. And so these will define what is called a representative plane. So you put a grid of initial conditions for each of these values. And for each, you can integrate them for a certain time span using an n-body code, and then assign to each of these points a numerical value, which is a dynamical indicator. For example, what is the maximum reach in uh, eccentricity or in say a major axis? What is the value of the Megno or the uh, chaos indicator, etc. So there are different dynamical indicators and different dynamical maps, and they give complementary information. So for example, if you calculate a, a dynamical delta A map uh, near the two to one resonance, you see certain features which you may identify as the separatrix or the mean motion resonance, the location and existence of libration centers, and even the existence of secondary resonances in the mouth of the main two to one resonance. The delta eccentricity map gives, on the other hand, information about secular motion. So you can have information about secular resonances inside the two to one mean motion resonance, as well as secular modes outside the resonance. You can also do maps with the chaos indicators. So this is the same region. You have a regular motion, at least in the integration time in white, and you have highly chaotic uh, <coughs> orbits in red, sorry, <coughs> and uh, less chaotic uh, solutions in white. So we may also ask ourselves whether we can also construct a similar map for instability times and what information that may give us about in the, in the system. So let us begin studying what is the stability of just two planets orbiting a single star. So if you have a case where one of the masses, say M2 is much smaller than the other two and the orbits of these primaries M0 and M1 is circular, then you all know that you fall into the well-known circular restrictive three-body problem and whose solution is well known. So you, you can define a certain uh, effective potential in the rotating frame. And so when you put the two primaries in the x-axis of this rotating frame, you have five equilibrium solutions, the most important of which for our case are the collinear points you can define or you can construct the hill curves. And even though the orbital en energy and the angular momentum of the particle of M2 is not preserved, there is a linear combination between both of them, which is called the Jacobi constant, which is preserved. So you can compare the Jacobi constant for any initial condition with that value for each of the Lagrange solutions. And you can establish conditions for stability, both for interior orbits as well for its exterior orbits. So this is well known, it's been used uh, in, in many different areas of astronomy. Its limitations are of course that M2 must be uh, negligible in its uh, gravitational effects over the other bodies. And 
This is only valid when you have that the eccentricity of the primaries is equal to zero. So the question is, what happens if the mass M2 is different than zero? Okay, so everything breaks down. Surprisingly, even though the interactions increase and the number of degrees of freedom also increase, you now have new integrals of motion in the system. In particular, the angular momentum and the orbital energy of the system now appear as separate integrals. And so there exist additional constraints on the motion, in particular something which is called the Sunman inequality, that allows you to generalize the same results that you found for the circular restricted free body problem to the general case. And this was mainly done by Marshall and collaborators in the 70s and the early 80s. And I would just like to review some of the, 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 the results. So if you defined what is called the mean quadratic distance and the mean harmonic distance of the system given by these equations here, then that Sunman inequality will give you or will define regions of motion such that this integral or this uh, uh, combination between the angular momentum and the orbital energy must be smaller than this value, which depends on the mutual distances. So this expression here uh, serves the function of the effective potential. And this expression here serves as more or less the Jacobi constant of the restricted circular problem. So if you give relative instant positions for any two of the masses and you plot the level surfaces of that rho over knee, you get practically the same type of topology of form as in the restricted circular case and also the existence of generalized Lagrange solutions. So if you have a look at the form of this uh, function in the x-axis, this may, this allows you to define a sort of energy level criteria, where if you have an energy which is less than the values at each of the Lagrange points, all the regions are accessible to the motion. But if the energy is above those of the Lagrange points, then the motion is restricted to around each of the, of the uh, main bodies or around them both. So this is exactly equal as in the restricted case, but now applied to the general three body problem. Okay. Surprisingly, this is the same thing independently or for different variables and different functions. And this, which I call the Marshall criterion, is valid for any mass ratio and any orbits. The main problem that this criteria has is that it was probably uh, developed too early in time before there was uh, much practical application of its potential. Uh, Gladman in 1993 deduced a simplified expression, which is now called the Gladman criteria, where the stability condition is given in terms of what is called the mutual Hill radius. This is valid only for near circular or near uh, coplanar orbits, and in the case where two of the masses are much smaller than the other, so just for the planetary case. But it's important to keep in mind that the Hill stability original instability of Marshall is much more general. Okay? And in fact, as more exoplanetary systems were discovered, more eccentric, more massive, and potentially more inclined, it proved important to review and revisit the original Marshall condition. And this was done uh, just a couple of years ago by Petit and collaborators. Okay, so it's keep in mind that the Glattman criteria is just an approximation of the original Marshall condition, which is much more um, general. Okay, there are a couple of issues with uh, the Hill stability. First, that is a sufficient but not unnecessary condition. So uh, if you don't comply with the uh, Hill stability, okay, you have a lot of unstable orbits, but you may also have some stable orbits, particularly associated with mean motion resonances. And these are stable at least for finite times. A second problem is that Hill stability allows collisions between the inner body and the central one or escapes of the outer body to infinity. So it says nothing about the boundness of the solutions. 
So if you are interested, not only in preserving the orbital hierarchy of the system, but also as that they remain bounded in time, then you have to open hand of field stability and begin to discuss what is called the Lagrange stability. The main problem with the Lagrange stability is that there is no simple theorem or simple energy level condition as we found in the Hill stability criteria. And so the way that we generally study the Lagrange stability is by something which is called the resonance overlap criterion, which was developed mainly by Chitikov in 1979. So the way this resonance overlap criterion works is that if you find a certain region in the phase space where resonances are isolated and they do not overlap, then the chaos that you will identify is local and the system is stable. If on the other hand, the resonances overlap, then you will have global chaos. This generates roots for diffusion and then you will have instability. So in order to differentiate between stable and unstable motion in the case of resonance overlap, you need necessarily to have reliable models for resonances, as well as ways to identify those regions in which this overlap occurs. And it's very interesting the way that in order to uh, uh, deduce conditions for something which is completely chaotic and completely unstable, you need integral models for isolated resonances. So it seems like the two extremes between highly numerical, highly unstable, and highly regular, highly analytical, they both give information about each other. So this is an example. Okay, so you, again, you have a dynamical map. This is delta E. You, the perturber is a Jupiter mass in circular orbit. So you have all these regions here which are unstable. And here I have highlighted the two to one resonance, which appears mainly isolated. And you can calculate analytically the uh, resonance width of all the first order resonances. So you have the two to one, the three to two, the four to three, five to four. You can see that they all increase in width and they become closer to each other as you move towards the orbit or the perturber. And so you can estimate an overlap of the first over order resonances and this gives you this region here. So what you can see now is that actually there are a lot of other resonances which are also contributing to the overlap, which are not reproduced by this simple first order resonance model. So you have to take into consideration higher order resonances, including second order, third order, and even higher order. As you see here, a lot of other resonances which are not yet modeled. There's a very interesting, very important work by Hayden and Lithwick, 2018. They analyzed in particular the region between the 3D2 and 4 to 3 resonance, and they mapped the uh, width of different resonances of different order. And they found that in order to reproduce the instability limit obtained numerically, they needed to include resonances up to order 30 in their model. So that is a lot of resonances. Okay. So on another hand, what you find is that when you plot here the limit given by the Hill stability, there is a significantly uh, uh, good agreement between what predicts the Hill stability limit and what you expect from the resonance overlap. They're not equal, but in some cases they are very similar. So what do we know, uh, what have we learned from the stability of the two planet problem? Okay, so you have basically two criteria. You have the simple uh, Marshall criteria for the Hill stability. It's very simple, it's very reliable, and it's valid for any finite mass masses and orbital parameters. You also have the Lagrange stability, which is estimated by the overlap criterion. And this requires to model analytically or at least semi-analytically high order mean motion resonances and the studies are usually restricted to the planar case. So even though it seems that the Hill stability is in some ways superior to the Lagrange stability, the use of resonance or overlap does allow you to understand why instability occurs and how it may be modeled. And this is very important because it allows you to know that instability is the result of diffusion in the phase space 
and diffusion occurs in regions dominated by global chaos. And it's this information that we will make use of at the end of the talk to develop our own criteria, okay? So, okay, so we know fairly well how two planets are interact and how to define limits of st stability. What happens for more than two planets? And this is where things begin to be complicated. First, there is no equivalent Marshall criteria for more than two planets. In fact, it is not apparently, at least as yet, there has been not been able to find any constraint to delimit regions of possible motion. So our, our only uh, solution is to attack this problem with resonance overlap. So this implies you have to build a cartography or a map and models for all possible resonances in a given end planet system and identify those regions where all these resonance may overlap. And this is a very complicated task. In order to show how complicated this can be, we can have a look at the resonance structure of just three planets and restrict it just to circular orbits. Okay, so I'm going to plot here uh, a map which is in the x axis the, the ratio of mean motions between the inner and the middle planet, and on the y axis is the ratio between the middle and the outer planet. And a dynamical map will find a way here. When we say that we will only analyze circular orbits, this is equivalent to in our previous map where we had eccentricity versus semi-major axis. Just having a look at this axis here where all the high order mean motion resonance, resonances have an almost zero width. So we're just having a look in this map at the important resonances that exist for circular orbits, not those that are important for non-circular orbits. So what you obtain at this time of, fe of features with a lot of different characteristics. So you can identify first order two planet resonances between the inner middle and middle and outer planets. You can identify second order resonances which appear now just as lines with almost zero width. You can also identify uh, two body resonance between the inner and the outer planet and does not include the middle planet. You can also uh, identify zero order three planet resonances or, or like resonance chains and first order three planet resonances as well. So you have a network of resonances which is extremely complicated and this is just for the circular case. To make things even more difficult at every intersection between two independent two planet resonances you have uh, an origin or at least a passage of several different zero and first order three body resonances. And this complicates the resonance not network even more. So we have two big problems. Actually, we have one big problem, which is that as the number of bodies increases, the network of resonance became, becomes much more complex and estimation of the overlap region becomes much more challenging. The second problem is not big, it's huge, and is that instant infinite time stability is not proved for the general end body case. In fact, what we learned from the Hill stability is that the, for two body problem or two planet problem, the Hill stability criterion guarantees us the existence of a stable region in the phase space. So even if we are not able to calculate the overlap of all the resonances up to infinite order, we know that such a region exists because Hill stability criterion exists. There is no such guarantee in the N greater than two planet problem. So even though it is relatively safe to assume that as the masses of the planets go to zero or as the mutual distances increase, you should have stable orbits, maybe for infinite time, it is not obvious that this happens or that this is applied to currently no planetary systems. So basically, we're not sure whether the planetary systems we observed are stable for infinite time. This is backed up by numerical simulations. So this is one of the first numerical simulations done many years ago for fictitious systems of five planets, which were equidistant between each other. And so this is the log of the escape time as a function of the mutual distance. 
and this was well represented by a uh, power law. So the escape time had a power law dependence with the distance of the bodies. More recent um, uh, numerical studies have increased the time, the integration time, and it does not appear, or at least it is not clear, that there is a limit to this value. Okay, so maybe if you continue integrating for 10 to 11, 10 to the 12 years, you will still find distances where these systems are still unstable. So what do we do if what we wish to study may not even exist? So, so if, if we cannot establish whether a, a given uh, embodied body system or embodied body planet is stable. Well, you can do then is shift your focus from studying stability regions to estimation of the instability times. So in that case, if you find a region which is stable for at least 10 to the nine or 10 to the 10 years, then this becomes a region of practical stability, even though it may disappear for longer times. In a certain way, this new approach is even more interesting than our original goal of trying to study the stability for infinite times. Perhaps all planetary systems are actually unstable, like has been proposed by Lascar and, Lascar and Gatineau for our own solar system. So searching for infinite time stability is not really uh, uh, interesting. Also, given that instability times, you may construct dynamical maps and which will give you some valuable insight, not only about the system's past evolution, but how different dynamical features can affect that instability as, as well. So, we have more than two planets. We know, or at least we don't know how to calculate the stability for infinite time. So we shift our attention to a stability or instability time. How do we do that? So as I mentioned in the beginning, in, in this last year, there have been two approaches, completely different, but both of them very interesting. The first one is by Petit and collaborators, and they uh, developed a completely anal analytical method. Basically, they concentrate on three planet systems on circular orbits. They apply the basis of the, the Killing uh, analytical model for zero or the three planet resonances. And they try to search those regions or the phase plane where these interact, where these overlap. And in those regions, they estimate a diffusion coefficient and um, for that, an instability time. So it's, it's a completely analytical model and it gives surprisingly good results. In fact, although they only use three planets, they're able to extrapolate their results for more planets. And this is the fit between their prediction and the Obertas et al simulations. And the agreement is surprisingly good, particularly for low instability times. So that's a very interesting way to approach the problem. A different method is a completely numerical using machine learning. And this is uh, presented by Tamajo and collaborators. And, and the algorithm or the software is called Spock. So basically what you do is generate a data set. Uh, you integrate them for 10 to the nine years. And so you are able to, uh, if you have any new uh, initial condition near one of those points of the, of, of the data set, you're able to estimate the stability comparing the outcomes of those conditions that are nearby. This is obviously a very fast algorithm. It, it works surprisingly well, but it was built up, uh, primarily to apply to Kepler type systems. So uh, it is used mainly for compact systems where the separations is not beyond the two to one mean resonance, near coplanar and with low eccentricities. So basically those, those are the two uh, routes or the two roads that are currently being developed. And so now I'd like to introduce to you our work. Okay, so what we are doing in this regard. So uh, we're using what is called Shannon entropy as a measure of the diffusion in planetary systems. The theoretical work was carried out by Cinkota, Giordano, and Shevchenko in three papers from 2018 to 2019. And this Shannon entropy actually is an information entropy that dates back to the 1948. Okay, so the idea of this information entropy 
was to measure the amount of information contained in a message. So a message here was a telegram or, 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 or any kind of written message. But the same concept can also be applied to any sequence of characters or of numbers. Okay? So the concept of me message is very much more general than origi originally intended. So the working hypothesis that we employ for Shannon entropy is assume a normal diffusion. So for example, if you have a distribution function P and what we use to analyze the time of evolution of this distribution function, we use a heat equation. We assume random walk. So the uh, equation depends on what is called a diffusion coefficient that we assume constant. And so this uh, distribution function mainly is a normal distribution whose dispersion increases linearly with time given by a factor which is that diffusion coefficient. But if we substitute that distribution function by an ensemble or a set of initial conditions in a dynamical system, you have exactly the same thing. So if you have a set of very close by initial conditions in, in, in a given plane, and you try to see what is the evolution of this distribution over time, then that set will diffuse in the phase space on a time scale that is inversely proportional to that diffusion coefficient. So we can relate these two concepts of a theoretical distribution function with an ensemble of initial conditions in a dynamical system. So how do we apply uh, Shannon entropy to planetary systems? Okay, so it's a series of steps. So I will try to explain what these are. The first thing we do is, okay, we do an embody simulation of uh, a given initial conditions. You have two here. So just imagine that you choose any one of them. So you have, for example, semi-major axis over time and eccentricity over time. And what you do is you plot one against the other. So you have that the orbit as a function of time appears as a distribution of points in the, the, pl in, in the plane, same measure axis versus eccentricity. In fact, you can use any other pair of action type variables. We found it better to use this one here, which is one is the same measure axis and another one the same measure axis plus a function of the eccentricity. These this choice maintains the same dimensions. And we found it very important to keep the eccentricity in the diffusion plane because diffusion in eccentricity is very important, for example, for planets in binary systems. And it's also very important to identify instabilities which are driven not by mean motion resonance chaos, but by secular chaos. Okay? So, so this choice implies longer integration times it's more difficult to separate the secular time scales with the chaotic dynamics, but it's worthwhile because it gives much more general results. So that's step one. Step two, you have this distribution of points in your diffusion uh, plane. And so you now divide this plane in a series of cells or grids. And then you, you calculate two very important quantities. One that we call R0, is the number of cells that are occupied by the trajectory at a time tk. And n i the k is the population or the number of times that the trajectory has passed through each of these cells after the time tk. So one gives you the number of occupied cells in all the, the, the population, and the other one gives you the population in each of these cells. With these two quantities, you can then calculate the Shannon entropy just by this expression. I will not deduce it, but mainly what this gives is a measure again of the amount of information contained in the sequence which describes the orbit. So let me give you two examples. First, if the orbit is just a fixed point, so you only have one occupied cell for all time, then the entropy is zero, is minimum. If you have a uniform distribution, for example, if your orbit is regular, if it's quasi periodic on a torus, then the entropy is just the natural logarithm of the number of occupied cells. Any other the solution will give you typically values between zero and this logarithm of R0. 
However, what is interesting, or what is more important, step four, is to calculate the time derivative of the entropy. In other words, how the entropy changes with time. And for that, we will change from this definition to something which is very similar, which was this one here. You can identify two main uh, terms in this expression. The first term is a measure of the number of occupied cells. And the second term gives you the population distribution with respect to the average population of all the, the, uh, of all the cells. So if you calculate the time derivative of this quantity, it will measure how the trajectory diffuses in the plane, analyzing two different characteristics. On the one hand, how the number of occupied cells increases with time, but also how the population density deviates from a uniform uh, uh, distribution. So it is this wealth of information, not only on the diffusion in the number of cells, but also how the population varies from a uniform definition, which gives you an, an extra amount of information about the diffusion of the system. In fact, this derivative is related to the diffusion coefficient by a very simple expression, which was this one here. Okay, the last step is to relate the diffusion coefficient with the instability time. And this is given simply by, uh, well, the instability time is inversely proportional to the diffusion coefficient. The uh, proportionality is given by the maximum allowed quadratic distance to the scape and by a factor that depends on the scape root in the plane, but it's something usually near one and we just take equal to one to uh, decrease the number of uh, independent or free parameters. Okay, so that's it. That's how the method works. Basically, you just do an embodied simulation and you uh, calculate that uh, entropy during the simulation and then you estimate its derivative that gives you uh, an approximation for the diffusion coefficient. And from that, you can estimate an instability time. So from just a small um, simulation, you can extrapolate features for long time scales. So let us see a couple of applications. The first application I will show you is a system called HD 181433. It was discovered recently and it has three planets, the outer two of which are very close to the seven one resonance. They have high eccentricities. They have masses about half of the Jupiter mass. And this is an in-body stability map presented by Horner et al. Each point is integrated with an n-body, so a code for 10 to the eight years. And they see that the nominal best fit is in what they seem to find is the stability region, right? at least for 10 to the eight years. So the first thing we did is to integrate the nominal solution. And we found that this is chaotic. It's extremely chaotic. Right? The, 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 the Lyapunov time is of the order of 10 to the four to 10 to the five years. And the reason why it's chaotic, this is a Megno map that we constructed around the nominal solution, is that it, it is in, on the limit between a highly regular region, which is here in blue, and a highly chaotic region here in red. And this dynamic is affected by this seven over one mean motion resonance. So if we concentrate around the nominal solution and we begin to do more detailed analysis, you find these Megno maps. Okay, so this is eccentricity over uh, same major axis. You have this big column, which is the seven over one resonance. But more interesting is this map, which is a mean anomaly over same major axis. And here you see the center of the seven to one resonance. You see its separatrix. You see very regular motion inside the island of the seven over one resonance and the nominal, nominal solution is right at the edge of the separatrix. And that explains the chaotic nature, nature of its evolution. So we can do the Megno map, but we can also calculate the instability map using our method. And this gives you these results. So even though we do have a larger instability, particularly in this region here on the left, where you have resonance overlap of high order resonances, and you also have a larger values here, which is the separatrix of the seven over one resonance. All these conditions 
still give you instability times which are much larger than the age of the system. So you have instability times of 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10, 10 to 11, and 10 to the 12 years. So the system is expected to be stable for long periods of time, independently of whether it lies inside or outside the resin. What we found interesting is that it appears to be a, a certain correlation between the Megno map and the instability map, in the sense that when you have high, high values of Megno, you have low values of instability time. And when we have low values of Megno, you have high values of instability time. Okay? So we keep this in mind to try to study further on if this correlation can, in some way, be modeled. Okay, so if we go beyond the nominal solution, we can analyze, for example, a distribution of uh, initial conditions in a nine segment, which all have the same eccentricity, but we are varying the same major axis deep inside the chaotic region. And along this segment, we can calculate the instability time, both with our method, which is given here in red, and comparing it with pure embodied simulations up to 10 to the nine years, which is here in black. And you see a very good agreement between the predictions of our method and the embodied results. An interesting additional information is the existence of a certain dispersion in the values of the instability time for very close nearby initial conditions. Okay? Are they, and this dispersion seems to have a, a reach of about one order or two orders of magnitude. Okay? So this is important also to keep in mind for the future. So going back to this segment, we can identify now three very strong resonances, the four to one here, which is this peak, the five to one here, and the six to one here. So we can define new segments and analyze what happens in more detail along this segment here, which we call A1, this one here centered in the five to one resonance, which we call A2, and this one near the six to one resonance, where we call A3. And so we again try to analyze in more detail. And so here again, you have for A1, A2, and A3, the instability times versus the same major axis, where we are comparing predictions from M body simulations, which are in brown, maybe, with two estimations using Shannon entropy from two different, slightly different methods that we employed. Actually, there were different parameters that we used. And what we find here is mainly that uh, a very good, good agreement between our predictions and the pure embodied simulations, except here. Okay? In the vicinity of the 4 to 1 resonance, what we find is that our method predicts stability for at least 10 to the 9 and 10 to the 10 years, while the embodied simulations give values which are two orders of magnitude smaller. And this is not just for just one initial condition, but for a whole set of initial conditions here. So clearly we have a problem, at least for this four to one resonance that we have tried to, that we have to try to understand. So going back to this dispersion, which we also not here. Okay, so why do we have a dispersion in instability times? And this, and this was presented by Rice uh, three years ago. And what they did was a whole bunch of numerical simulations of very close by initial conditions. And what they found systematically at exactly the same thing, that the instability times they distribute showing a log normal distribution. And this is mainly caused by the chaotic nature of the system. Hussain and Tamajo showed also they did a whole other series of numerical simulations for different initial conditions, different regions of the phase space, and different types of systems, both resonant and random. And what they found, not only the same type of log normal distribution, but that the, the standard deviation of that log normal distribution always seemed to be very similar, around half an order of magnitude. So this seems to be a characteristic of planetary systems due to the chaotic nature of their uh, uh, motion. So what happens with our method? Are we able to reproduce this dispersion? 
So again, we analyze conditions we call A1, A2, and A3. A1 is, uh, I think it was right in the, the, the 41 resonance. So this is the dispersion we obtain from n-body simulations. And this is the dispersion that we find utilizing using our method. So in general, we also reproduce a sort of a log normal distribution where the width is similar and the mean is similar to the n-body values, except for the one that is lies near the separatrix of the four to one resonance, where we find a secondary peak of highly theoretically stable solutions that don't actually exist. So again, we have a problem with this region here. So why? What happens to initial conditions near the four to one mean modulation resonance that makes our estimations wrong? So we're not really sure what happens. We suspect that it could be resonance stickiness. Mainly what happens is that due to the structure of the separatrix, you begin to have some remnants of some uh, 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 regular islands where the orbit appears to be stuck for long time spans, for example, 10 to the five or 10 to the six years, and they only escape uh, later than that. So if you analyze the dynamics for short time scales, <clears throat> you see a seemingly regular and stable motion, but in the long run, it becomes unstable. So if this is in fact the cause of uh, this, this effect, then the whole hypothesis that we began with a model, with a model which is normal diffusion, breaks down. Diffusion is no longer model; it's more so more of a levy flight, and so our method cannot adequately describe the long term dynamics. So this is what we believe is happening, and so this is a word of warning for our method, mainly that the separatrix of strong mean motion resonances may uh, constitute a weakness for our numerical approach. And we are not very clear, at least so far, what constitutes a strong mean motion resonance or under what conditions this resonance thickness may affect our estimations of the instability time. Okay, so this is a, a word of caution and we have to keep studying this problem. So the second system that we uh, studied is a very well-known system, it's GLIS 876. So you have four planets, a massive planets orbiting a small star. The three outer ones in particular, are uh, they form a Laplace type resonance. It's the first system that was found in a Laplace type resonance. And what makes it even more interesting is that even though it was discovered uh, over 10 years ago, all the successive best fits as new observational data uh, begins to pour in, they always lead to best fits which are extremely chaotic. And the Lyapunov of time is as slow as 10 years, despite the system being stable for giga year timescales. So this is a very extreme case where you have highly chaotic solutions, but yet they are stable. So we wonder how our method will be able to cope with this extreme system, okay? So this is just a magna map of the eccentricity versus same major axis of the outer planet. All these points here in uh, brick color are unstable in very short time scales. The nominal solution is down here, which when you make a zoom, gives you what is the, the limitation of the Laplace resonance island, all or most of it highly chaotic, right? With a magna, which is extremely large, and you have a non-resonant region up here, which is much more regular, okay? So this is, again, this is the nominal solution of the system. So when we do the same map, now applying our Shannon criteria and calculate instability times, we get as expected, very good results for the non-resonant region. So we get highly stable for at least 10 to the 10 years, but we also get very good results for the Laplace resonance region. So our method predicts that the system and nominal, sol nominal solution is highly stable, stable with very long instability times, even though it is extremely chaotic. Okay. Going back our idea of a certain correlation between Magno values or Lyapunov times and instability times, we find something of the sort in the non-resonant region, but we do not find any correlation inside the Laplace resonance. 
You can also do the same kind of maps varying the locations of the inner and the middle planet. And you also find some very nice uh, uh, forms. And as usual, you find that the uh, nominal solution is in a very stable region, but this stable region is extremely short, extremely small. Okay, so, so it's very, 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 very small changes in the eccentricity or in the same major axis can lead to escape of the system in very small time scales. So the last thing I want to, to, to discuss with you is this, this thing about the correlation between the Lyapunov time and the instability time. Okay? And this is really a, a very interesting subject because it's been around for 30 years. Okay? So at the beginning of the 90s, there were a series of papers by Lekar, Franklin, Morrison, and Sotter, where uh, following a series of numerical simulations, they proposed a power law relation between the encounter time or the instability time and the Lyapunov time with a, a power law exponent of 1.8. Okay. So they did a series of numerical simulations for different types of system and they calculated the escape time and the Lyapunov time. So in a log log plot, they found they could fit a straight line and that straight line usually had an exponent of close to 1.8, sometimes 1.7, sometimes 2, sometimes 1.6, but in general, the average value was 1.8. Okay, so it was very important, very, very interesting, because it meant that we, if we find this time of, cor of correlation, we can estimate the stability time of a system just by calculating the Lyapunov, which is much more easier, much, much more uh, 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 fast to do. Many other people try to study the same correlation in other systems. Okay, this is the case of Siganis for the Trojan asteroids. All the cases studied by, by Lekar for, for, for the restricted case, not for the planetary system. And even Mikola and Tanikawa studied the three body problem with equal masses. Uh, and they also found in general a uh, power law relation with an exponent close to 1.8. So since we have this method that seems to work very well to estimate the instability time, even for very high values, we can calculate EC, the Lyapunov time. Is it possible that we can find a similar results, a similar correlation for planetary systems? So if we do the same thing here for the system HD181433, so remember this is our instability time map, mean motion and the mean anomaly over the same major axis, you obtain all these values for the instability times, and we can also calculate the values for the Lyapunov uh, uh, times. So we plot one versus the other, and we get something that looks awful, okay? It doesn't look like a straight line. There is a certain correlation, but what you see is basically a series of clusters, of groups of points. So we said, okay, can we identify or relate each of these groups to some structures in the instability map. And we found that this cluster down here, which basically is all the initial conditions which are very low Lyapunov times and low instability times, correspond to this region here where you have the overlap of high order resonances. This second uh, group here is associated to the separatories of the, of the uh, 71 resonance. This third uh, region here appears to be uh, maybe invariant tori uh, or, 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 or maybe high order resonances around uh, the 71 resonance. Similarly, this region here, which has higher values of Lyapunov, but apparently very similar values with escape time. And finally, this segment here corresponds to very high values of the instability time and is expectedly the center or the, uh, or the inner region of the 71 resonance islands. So if you think of this more in a broad scope type of manner and not just look at the individual values, but at the clusters, you say, okay, maybe we can try to fit here a straight line and you can, and the exponent is 1.8. Okay, so that was surprising. We still don't know what it means or why it happens, 
but we, we, we are, we're researching this, we're working on this, but, but, but it seems to find things to be very interesting. As you may expect, Gleeset does not give the same results. So if you try to correlate both quantities for the non-resonant region, you do seem to find some sort of correlation, but for the Laplace resonance, you don't. And basically most of the solutions have very small Lyapunov times, but very large instability times, just as you find for the nominal solution. So it seems that some systems, this works, and for some other systems, they don't. So to, to close, uh, some general conclusions. So we found that if, if you have only two planets in your system, you have several or at least two different stability uh, criteria which work very well, but their extension to more than two planets is extremely challenging. And so the, 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 the focus of the research in the last few years have evolved towards for finite time criteria or estimations of the instability times, okay? Even so, those instability times may vary for up to two orders of magnitude, depending just on the intrinsic chaotic nature of the system. So not only are we not able to say whether a system is stable or not, but how long it survives, we also have a very large uncertainty. Some systems, and at least in some regions of the phase space, seem to show correlation between the Lyapunov time and the instability times, others don't. So chaos indicators are not always reliable proxy for orbital stability or instability. With respect to our method, we introduced a numerical technique to estimate the instability time based on Shannon entropy. It is very general, it is applicable to practically all planetary systems, regardless of the number of planets, masses, or orbital parameters. One thing which is very interesting and I didn't mention is that it is possible to estimate the instability time for each individual planet of the system. So this means that we not, are not able, not only able to estimate how long the system will survive, but also which would be the body that first disrupts or first escapes or collides. Although this method has proved at least so far fairly precise, there is problems when you have a, a diffusion that is not well represented by a normal diffusion. And this happens, for example, near the separatrix or very strong resonances. Uh, numerically speaking, it, it is usually three orders of magnitude faster than a full 10 to the nine years in body simulation. So it's not as fast as Spock, for example, but it still is very, very, very fast. So a couple of things that we're still trying. Uh, first, since we use ensembles of systems, we are trying to see if this ensemble can give us information, not only about the mean value of the instability time, but also about the standard deviation and try to study how these values varies as a function of the different dynamical indicators. And something also that we have not uh, uh, explored sufficiently is how we may identify secular driven instabilities as opposed to those dominated by mean motion resonances. So this is work yet for the future. Okay. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Christian. Very nice. I really love the, the talk okay. okay now the talk is open for questions uh, please uh, raise your hand if you want to ask a question to christian and i will uh, let you open the mic first fast question what is the mango ah, mango okay yeah, sorry about that uh, mango is uh, is, is uh, means uh, mean exponential growth of nearby orbits is an indicator of chaos. Okay, so it's a, it's a way you can estimate uh, the Lyapunov number or, 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 or the Lyapunov characteristic exponent of a chaotic orbit. Okay, I have one question. Uh, I love this part of the entropy because I, I was really always curious about the this entropy and the complex systems. So that number 1.8 is maybe like a, a, a very nice number. Do you compare with other complex systems in nature, for example, if, if you can compare? 
I, I, I don't know. There, there was a time in, in, in the late 90s and, and the early 2000s where different people uh, try, uh, try to uh, uh, apply that or study different type of astronomical systems. Okay, so uh, you had Nicola studying uh, complicated three body problems that collide three, four. You had some other applications also for galaxies. I think Lascar studied that. Uh, because it, it, it was very curious. Nobody expected this type of correlation. You have to remember that the Lyapun of time or the Lyapun of exponent is a very uh, local characteristic of the phase space. Right? While the instability time, you estimate when that uh, solution has uh, 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 traveled along the phase space. So there should, in principle, not be any reason why the characteristic component or where it begins should correlate with the instability time. But in many cases it does. But uh, uh, there are certain works uh, in the late 90s, uh, Morbidelli and Freshly, more recently by Shevchenko, trying to find reasons for this, when it should work, when it shouldn't work. Uh, but I think it's still an open question. And I don't know if this also extrapolates to other areas where you can also calculate uh, uh, chaos and some type of instabilities. I have no idea, but I would be very interested in that, in that question. Nice. Other questions for Christian? Don't be shy. I have another one. Can you use this plot, exactly this one, to discover a new planet? Okay. I mean, you have a system with three planets, like this one, and, and, you, and you have this plot. Yeah. And, and you see that the, the system is in certain point which is not stable. Uh, and then if you add one planet, you move it to a stable region. Exactly, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, when, when I first began studying this and I gave my, my, my first seminar, the people questioned me, okay, why do you want to study stability of systems? Because obviously if you observe a system, it's stable, right? I mean, it's stable for the age of the system. So it, 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 it's a question whose answer you already know. In, in fact, okay, there, there are many different applications. First, uh, uh, as you all know, when you observe a system, you make a best fit, there's always a certain error. And so you can use this type of, of method to quantify the stability of the best fit or try to find regions close to it, which are much more stable and, and much more probable to host a planet. But also I'm going more to, to, to the question you can, for example, there was, there was this, this hypothesis a few years back of, of uh, uh, tightly packed systems in the sense that if you have a system of two or three planets which are discovered and there is a place in the middle where a stable planet could fit, then very possibly there could be such a planet. Mm -hmm. And so in order to, to try to deduce what possible planets could exist, you have to uh, 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 analyze not only possible uh, uh, values of same major axis, eccentricities and the angles, but also different values of the masses. And so these type of maps are very useful in principle for that type of study. Okay, so they could give you insight of where a planet could exist and what would be, for example, its mass. So yes, yes, that, that is an application of this type of, of, of tool. Yeah, or you can do the exercise with this one, uh, forgotten one planet and, and see what happened and then add in the- Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. More questions? Is this, this, uh, Method, uh, can you apply with this terrestrial planet? It's independent of the masses. Planet? It's independent of the masses, yes, yes. So, yes. what happened with the Trappist planet? Uh, we haven't Is applied it. it. Um, don't, we have focused on, 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 on 
system which are more massive and highly eccentric and 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 uh, that that seemed more close to instabilities uh trappist planets or 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 these resonance chains are usually very very uh, uh, cold systems with low eccentricities uh we have not applied it yet but it's possible it, it has no limitations on, on masses or on the number of planets or on the orbits so in principle yes you can apply it with no problems Okay, we have a question here. Mike, please open your micro. Yeah. Okay, hello, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the great talk. Um, I have a question. You mentioned that your method, uh, you, can, you can compute the instability time for, for an individual object, for an individual uh, planet. Yes. That means that you can calculate when it's, for example, ejected yes. from, the, from the system. And uh, does your code then consider that the system itself uh, has changed? And then, when you when you when you follow the you know, the equations, then uh, that you have a changed uh, changed system. Yes. What, what what you do is you you do a relatively short integration. You you uh, ten to the five, ten to the four years. It depends on the secular periods of of the planets. And you follow the evolution of the eccentricity and same energy axis of each of the planets. You construct that, that diffusion plane for each of the planets. And for each planet, you estimate its diffusion rate. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can have an estimation of the instability time of each of the planets. Uh, we don't know what happens after those. So, so, so for example, uh, uh, what usually happens so far is that always the outer planet is the one that has the lowest instability time, which is natural. I mean, the outer planet is the one which is least bounded to the system and the one which is more, most uh, 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 expected to, to be ejected. But for example, if we try, uh, apply it to the solar system, which we haven't done yet, we would expect, for example, that Mercury would be the one with the lowest instability time, okay? which is the inner, innermost planet because it also has the highest eccentricity and the lowest mass. So in principle, this would give us a lot of valuable information, uh, but we haven't really explored it yet in the sense of trying to uh, apply it to systems where not only the outer planet, but also one of the other planets may, may be ejected. Okay, thank you. Okay. So we can expect that the outer planets should be more massive as no, the no, the, the, the outer planet, okay, there is a tendency for particularly Kepler systems, so, so, so you have them, uh, uh, the, the outer planets are in general uh, larger, this could be an observational effect, but what I'm saying is that the outer planet generally is less bounded to the system, okay, it's easier to eject the outer planet than say the, the, the middle planet. Uh, changes in energy, changes in angular mom momentum are easier for the outer planet than for the middle planet, for example. And all the cases that we have studied, in particularly these two, it is always the outer planet that has the lowest instability time. It is always the outer planet that is ejected first or collides. Okay, but uh, uh, the increases in the eccentricity or the increases in the or changes in the same major axis always occur. And more and more pronounced in the outer planet. So far. Nice. Okay. Other question for Christian? We can let you go. Okay. Thank okay. you very much, Christian, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I will up upload to our YouTube channel and give you the link. And again, thank you very much for, for this uh, talk. Thank you for the attention. Okay.